Hello, yes. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, as you have said, my name is Michael Collins. Uh, I am a, I sort of backed into computer security from uh, computational sciences several years ago. And um, a lot of my work over the last few years has been looking at very large volumes of traffic data and trying to figure out how to make sense of them. So the topic today in, on exploratory data analysis is really intended as a foundational uh, discussion. And um, I'll talk a bit about my motivation as we go through this, uh, because where I'm coming from is this idea that um, information security is a very young discipline. Um, and because of that, we don't have a clearer idea of how to do analysis like we would, say, in finance or chemistry or things like that. We're still feeling out what works and doesn't work. And so, and at the same time, we came to, we came to maturity when an awful lot of computational tools became available to us, which meant that we could go off and do very complicated things without necessarily knowing if that was the right thing to do. So that's motivated how I've approached this problem, and that's motivating a lot of the talk today. So with that in mind, let me give a brief outline of the talk. Basically, the talk is about EDA uh, in the context of security. EDA is a combination of a number of well-defined mathematical disciplines, and then there's enormous amount of art associated with it. How to pick the data you're working with, how to decide when you're done, which like most creative projects usually means that somebody drags it from you while you're screaming that you've still got some more work to do on it, and how to interpret what you're actually looking at. Um, I'm a big believer that uh, we need to do EDA and security because we're dealing with a constantly moving target. We know that what we're observing knows that it's being observed and really wants to fiddle with our heads if it can get away with it. So it's not a situation where we can trust uh, the numbers automatically. Uh, I find that what we're going to end up doing is constantly going back to doing exploratory analysis because the uh, uh, targets of our observation move and the internet of its itself moves in a lot of odd and different ways. So this talk is going to talk about the process of EDA, the loop that you go through, uh, also to a certain extent building up the confidence to start sloppy and get to a more refined endpoint. And then I'm going to talk about visualization uh, in a fair depth because it's the most common, in, it's not only the most common technique, it's the foundational technique that I think you have to start with. Um, an awful lot of this is about letting the data talk to you and figuring out if you need to be clever later. Okay. So EDA, as I said, is exploratory data analysis. Now, uh, I, I should really say, you know, it the reason that I was motivated to do this in the first place is because the whole motivation for the book, actually, is that I've run into too many situations where people go automatically, ah, I've got a variable, I can, calculate, um, I can calculate an average, I can calculate standard deviations, I go three and a half standard deviations, I've got a threshold, I've got an alert. The problem is that that normally ends up, because the data we're dealing with is usually these heavy-tailed, non-normal distributions, you end up with a threshold that may be larger than it is physically possible for something on your network to, for, to that can actually occur on your network. For example, I've seen people set up a scan detection system on, say, a slash 16, so 65,000 addresses. They calculate that the mean is 280 hosts. They don't throw out the scans in the data set, and they find standard deviation is 30,000 hosts. So we know that it's going to be 200 plus or minus 30,000 hosts, three and a half standard deviations. So, you know, if we see 105,000 or more hosts being hit by a, a half open TCP connection, raise an alert. Great, I've only got 65,000 hosts on my network. I've got the perfect alarm. It's never going to go off. Anyway, and on an ops floor, an alarm that never goes off can actually, you know, well, anyway. Um, so this is about looking at the data for that reason. It's a process of summarization and examining the data and finding the things that are funny and moving on from there, okay? Now, this sort of runs back to what I was saying. 
Um, a lot of the motivation for EDA came in the 1970s from Tukey, and uh, one of the words that he kept coming back to uh, as he was talking about it is robust. And the idea is that a lot of the summary statistics, the, uh, the mean and the like, are not particularly robust. And the classic example of this is what you see on the right, what's called the Anscombe Quartet. Now, the Anscombe Quartet is a set of four uh, is, is four data sets which have the same, uh, they have the same standard deviation, they have the same correlation, all of that. And when you actually take a look at visualizations, they look completely different. The fun thing as well is if you go online, you can find a number of tools to generate your own Anscombe Quartet sets. And again, in security, this is important because you know, when we take a look at, uh, we take a look at uh, variables that don't hate us, we can expect a certain amount of good behavior. But attackers, they, they're interested in the outlier behavior. They want some place to dwell where they can't be detected. I spent a lot of time looking at insiders lately, and you know, we're dealing with people who are intelligently figuring out ways that when they're being observed to dodge being observed. Okay. So, and this gets to what I think of as the real element here. Let the data talk to you. This was something that uh, Jay Cadane, who is a professor of statistics at Carnegie Mellon, told me when I was uh, sort of in the middle of my doctorate and in that really ambitious phase where I was going to demonstrate to everybody how clever I was by using complicated clustering algorithms and things like that. First off, pragmatic, op pragmatic observation. Security data just isn't that controlled or that good. We don't have a lot of techniques that work on data that messy without a lot of examination, a lot of, a lot of observation, a lot of corner cases accommodate it. And that's the key thing. You need to look at the data and figure out what actually works. And oftentimes what EDA is about is about teaching yourself about the data, what it is, what's weird about it, why it matters. When you reach the end of the EDA process, this often informs how you publish the results to the rest of the world. When you're building a console, knowing that the data uh, goes between these ranges can inform, the uh, can inform how you visualize uh, the data itself you know, in an operational context. Uh, EDA is about looking at the information without those assumptions ahead of time and then figuring out what's the best approach to take. Okay? So what's the EDA process like? EDA is an iterative process. This is a simple workflow I've provided here. And there's some core things I want you to take away from this. The first is that you don't take what you do with EDA and operationalize it. Well, ideally you don't, but much like ideally you don't take the prototype and put it in the field. EDA should be a process where you go through it, you make some decisions about what you've done, and then you think about how to turn it into something operational. EDA is talking to yourself, using things like log normal plots, things I probably wouldn't do in the outside world. EDA itself, at its heart, is a lather, rinse, repeat process. You extract data from some source, you apply uh, some kind of technique to the data, that technique in turn lets you see that something funny is going on there, or something that merits further examination, and you repeat the process until you think you've reached a satisfactory answer. As I say, the art is knowing when to end it. So, and you know, from my view, when we talk about security analysis, what we're really talking about is how we make decisions that affect security. And in the case of security, a lot of times we're going to start with some jumping off point for our EDA. It's going to be something in the nature of we're doing a forensic analysis. We're doing a, we're examining traffic to get some sense of normalcy for it. That affects how we extract the data because it gives us a general framework to start the extraction. And that's really the beginning point of any EDA process and the touchstone you come back to constantly is the process of extraction. Um, I like this metaphor. The, the image over here is one of Michelangelo, is Michelangelo's atlas sculpture. And to me, it says a lot about what EDA is like, which is it's a process of continuous refinement. And the most logistically messy part of that 
is the original pull of the data. In particular, if you're working with a data warehouse or any large data set where there is an actual physical constraint on pulling data out of it, um, extraction is the process of you figuring out this is the smallest, or this is the finest, most refined query I can do at this point to, uh, to begin exploration. And because it's iterative, you'll find yourself coming up with finer and finer or more precise refinements as it happens. And this may go anywhere from defining a query to defining instrumentation or analysis. For example, I'm doing some work on DNS right now, and the goal, I'm comparing packet length and looking if I can predict DNS messages or activity via that, via that, data, uh, via that data without looking at the payload itself. My f current pulls are now, you know, fairly tightly categorized. I've got ski name queries, I've got queries to CDNs, I've got queries to different categories of CDNs, different classes of DNS servers, all of that. I didn't have much of a touchstone to start with, so I began with two hours of web surfing and the DNS queries from that. Uh, that helped guide me into more sophisticated and refined requests. Okay. Now, in security, we usually have a couple of fixed things we're working with. We might be looking at a time range or an IP address because a lot of our work is going to be forensic. Um, or it may be that we can uh, work by port number or something else to say that it's a particular service or network. And once we've got that initial pull, then we move on from there. But the key thing really in any exploratory process, and this is, this is one of those points when the wealth of choices available can paralyze you, the key thing is that when you start, you start sloppy. You start with something where there's a low risk uh, involved. Start with that, and then you can begin to build more complex or more sophisticated instrumentation or queries as, time pa as you get a clearer idea of what you're doing. If we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be exploratory data analysis. Now, from my view, all analytical techniques are basically summarization techniques. What you're really doing at this point is you're taking a whole pile of data and you're trying to come up with some way to look at it that gives you, you know, the most magical thing of all you can find in research, which is to say, ah, there's something funny there. Okay? Now, there's a variety of computational tools available for doing this. The headache is when you apply the tools without necessarily the intuition. So you've got visualization, you've got clustering techniques, you've got regression analyses. The problem is that when you apply them naively, you wander off in directions. So for example, if you talk to uh, econometrists or people who do regression analysis in depth, they'll occasionally talk about this phenomenon called stargazing, which is a trap in naive regression analysis because when you look at a regression table, significance is usually indicated visually by a bunch of asterisks on the side, and people make beelines for the results with the most asterisks without necessarily analyzing the residuals or things like that. The techniques are easy. They're really easy now because we've built tools like R that let us do them at the command line. The real problem is not doing the technique, it's really interpreting the technique. And that's, you know, to a large extent, I'm an arch conservative with what I do. I, I always pull out visualization initially so that I can even see if I've got statistical, if I've even got behaviors that I can apply to the more complicated stuff. So, okay. And then this is lather, rinse, repeat. You start EDA with some idea of what you want to do, and you keep repeating the process until you reach some compromise between you're satisfied with what you've got and your external constraints. It's a lot like any other creative project in that um, you, know, you can continue working on exploratory data analysis infinitely. And in fact, that in my experience is much of the danger with EDA, especially with network traffic, is that network traffic changes so much and there are so many things we don't understand about it that it's very easy to wander off in odd little directions and start looking at things that make no sense. And you can spend forever doing it. Um, you know, it's every time I've done a creative project, I've valued having an editor or someone on the outside world to drag me away from it. If I don't have that, I have to impose some kind of hard limit. Say, I'm going to do this for a week and then whatever I've learned at that point, then I move on from there. 
I find as a rule of thumb, it's a good thing, you know, as I've described EDA here, I've described it as a loop. And I find that it's very useful when doing this type of loop to stop at every iteration and reevaluate whether or not I'm actually achieving my goal. Because there's an awful lot of stuff, as I said, that's really interesting and I can go fiddle with it all day long. And it's just one of those things where you have to stop and say, not relevant, relevant, could be relevant later. Um, separating the process of EDA from the actual process of reporting, building consoles, building alarms, things like that, is I think an important mental step in doing this. If you don't do that, then you're going to eventually find yourself, you know, six months are going to have passed and you're not going to have, uh, you're going to have found a lot of things that are interesting, but not relevant. So, all right. So with that in mind, in this talk, I'm going to focus in particular on visualization, how to choose them, developing a, a basic intuition for how visualization relates to the data proper, and then some discussions on how to build visualizations. Uh, I'm thinking about this in particular in the context of building a console, building a dashboard, building supporting information for some type of IDS. Um, these days, when I build detection systems, I generally don't think in terms of alerts. I think in terms of charts that are produced from my uh, data because, and I'll say this just as a general rule for IDS at this point, I do not like the idea of IDS as an alert. It tends to drive ops floor people running around like headless chickens all the time. Better to get as much information together, compile it into a single visualization that the operator can then use to facilitate decision making. making. Because the, the dete detection isn't the hard part, it's figuring out what to do with the result of the detection. So, the nice thing about visualization is that there's actually a nice clean breakdown between how we relate the data to the basic set of visualizations available to us. Now, this is the basic taxonomy of variables that Stevens developed ages ago. I'm not going to touch on character data here, partly because a lot of the work I do is very net flow driven, partly because the increased use of encryption and the like means that to me, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to get to the point where we're not going to be able to drill down into packet sessions as deeply. Also because if you really want the best stuff on this, you gotta go find a bioinformaticist. Anyway, so there's basically two major classes, classes of data we're looking at, quantitative and categorical. Quantitative is what you think of as a number. Categorical data is stuff which is, which does not have any sort of, um, you can't, perform numerical operations on it. So it's things like ranked first, second, third, fourth, fifth. You know, you can have something first, second, and third, but you can't add second and third together to get fifth. Uh, or, it's purely, or, or it's purely nominal data, states in the union, T, uh, TCP port assignment. In particular, when you're dealing with network traffic data, everything we get looks like a number, but it isn't necessarily used as a number. And then there's the actual relationship, univariate, bivariate, and multivariate, okay? So just to go through some examples of the type of data, and in particular what you're likely to see on a, um, uh, on a, on a uh, feed that is actually in these categories. Interval data is data where the difference is meaningful, but the ratio isn't. So this is start time, end time. Those are sort of the classic ones. Ratio data is the stuff which is actually what we might think of as sort of actual quantitative data, number of bytes, number of packets, all right? Ordinal data is stuff where there is a ranking system. So for example, every IDS I've ever run into has some type of significance figure. Uh, Ceph, for example, uh, has, a, uh, has, in its he has in every alert header a significance value. And then nominal data. And these are categories where order doesn't have a, mean, doesn't have a real meaning. Now, uh, the thing about this taxonomy in particular is obviously when you take a look at network traffic data, you know, everything is a number, all right? That said, port numbers, IP addresses, protocols are really nominal data. There are things where, you know, I cannot add together, uh, I cannot add together DNS and port 70 and end up with NTP. There's no real concept of addition, and it's really how you manipulate the data that defines which category it's in here. Now the flip side of that is because we are dealing with security, you will find that there is some guy out there who has decided that he is going to use mathematic relationships between ports because he can, okay? Now, 
So those are the types of data we're working with, and those will in turn govern the types of visualizations uh, that we can do. Now, when we talk about data sets, univariate, bivariate, and multivariate, first off, when I actually pull data for analysis, I've usually got, you know, 14, 15, 18, 20 different variables that I've pulled down. I spend a lot of time working with NetFlow, which means by default I'm dealing with nine variables. But when we're talking about visualizations, it helps to start by talking about univariate, bivariate, multivariate. So you know, what, what I'm really dealing with here is whether or not there's a relationship between these variables. And oftentimes this comes down to really to um, how I look at a particular event, you know, univariate data, the number of bytes, bivariate data, the number of bytes per protocol, uh, multivariate data, the number of bytes per protocol over time of day going over this particular circuit. Okay. But that gives us a nice relationship between visualizations and the data we're dealing with. So when we're dealing with univariate data, we look at, uh, you know, if we're dealing with quantitative data, we've got histograms and box plots. We've got nominal data, we've got bar plots, all right? In the case of bivariate data, uh, you know, if I've got quantitative and qualitative, if I've got quantitative data and other quantitative data, I'm pulling the scatter plot. Uh, if I'm dealing with nominal data and quantitative data, I'm going to start stacking box plots together. And stacking box plots, this is an important step here because when we want to start talking about increasing the number of variables in a plot, what we're in a visualization, what we're really doing is we're adding information. And oftentimes the easiest way to do that is to go to one of these lower order plots and either use multiple versions of it or overload the information by adding information like color. Um, there are a number of different tweaking techniques that are available for doing this. I'm going to spend a chunk of time at the end of this talking about trellising, which is my preferred technique. For a lot of reasons, color, in my opinion, you can use it, but it's not remotely as powerful as the toolkits would let you think it is. It's just easier to add more colors, but very hard to interpret them. So, this is a histogram. Everybody should know what a histogram is anyway, but you know, it's a plot of the frequency of occurrences at specific values. This is the most basic plotting tool for univariate data. Um, you know, I, yeah, I don't know that there is really more to say about it than that. It's just the first thing you pull out. And in the case of R, you know, in the case of R, you can plot it using the plot function, or you can use it with hist. Hist, if you've used R before, hist generates a histogram object, which is an entity with its own values that you can uh, uh, examine. It'll give you the breaks, it'll give you the five number summary, things like that, okay? Now, one thing to add here about R and uh, plotting histograms, I have never found R's default breaks on histograms to be particularly satisfying. I usually find myself uh, tweaking the breaks an awful lot. I mean, it's easy to do that, um, and uh, that's sort of my gut reaction is to say, I'm going to increase the number of breaks until I get something where I see some actual structure in it. Anyway. So when we actually take a look at a histogram, so, <clears throat> and this is really where we get into the exploratory part of the EDA, which is taking a look at these visualizations and spending an enormous amount of time trying to figure out what there is in the visualization that makes sense or information that we really need there. So let me go, you know, what I'm looking for in any visualization is I'm looking for odd things. And the reason I'm looking for these odd things is because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that information, it's going to inform another query, and then that query is going to, um, uh, when I, that query is going to in turn um, uh, function, uh, that, sorry about that. Um, what I look, okay. Give me a second to take my breath in. All right, what I'm saying here is that I'm looking for odd stuff. When I find odd stuff, if I'm looking at the visualization, I'm looking for a range of values on the query, and once I've got that range of values on the query, I'm going to go back, repeat the, uh, repeat the process, and see if there's anything in common about this stuff. For example, the stuff here where I've got the range of, say, about 30 to 80, where I've got a secondary mode. Now, the odd things I'm looking at, modes. Mode, obviously, is a peak. Uh, mode, uh, your class definition of a mode is the most, common uh, the most commonly occurring value. 
when you visualize on a histogram, modes are going to be peaks. Um, the, what I'd be curious about in any visualization and any histogram is how many modes I've got, because it's usually the best indicator I've got common phenomena. For example, if I pull data over 24 hours, uh, say the number of bytes passing over circuits uh, every five minutes, um, and then I'm going to take a look at it, I'm usually going to find that there are two modes in that, one for, e one for evening, one for, more, or one for work day, one for off of work day. That's the kind of thing where I'm automatically going to go jump and take a look to see if time of day is a common factor there. The other thing is the tail, because the tail is an enormous pain in, pain in the tuchus with every uh, security problem I've ever dealt with. When you take a look at network traffic, you end up with these rare, extreme phenomena. You're taking a look at the number of bytes per day, and for some reason, all of a sudden, everyone's looking at some viral video on YouTube, and the total volume of traffic goes up for about two hours, and that tail ruins all of your measurements. So that's the first thing I'm looking for. So anyway, uh, and then the model. Now, I'm just going to give you a general rule of thumb when I do visualizations, which is that when I put a line in a visualization, it's an estimate or an inferred value or a model or a fit. It is not the actual data. It's something there to help me interpret the data. Anyway, um, so uh, in my personal opinion, you know, uh, I just usually include these things. Honestly, it's because I've been dealing with the uh, standard deviation uh, mode thing for so long that I slightly go nuts over it. <coughs> anyway, um, so next slide. All right, now bar plots, bar plots. Uh, okay, so a bar plot, the difference between it and a histogram is breaks. Um, remember, histograms are working over numerical data. Uh, bar plots are working on categorical data, which means that the which means that the breaks are explicit in the data itself. Now, this being a data visualization discussion, I have to spend at least a minute saying why we don't use pie charts. Because, you know, if you've read anything on scientific visualization, the first thing they say is don't use pie charts. And of course, the first thing that Excel gives you if you want is pie charts. Um, so, the short version of it, and I think that this is important when we get from the exploratory to the publishing aspect of the data, is that pie charts are easier to create than they are to interpret. It's hard to understand angles in a pie chart, and especially when you're dealing with multiple values and comparing multiple data sets. Uh, having a whole bunch of angles there, what you find is people start putting numbers in the pie chart, and the next thing you know, the, you've got so much annotative data there, it doesn't help any. And I think that that's actually a good lesson in general when you're thinking about visualizations. Think Bauhaus. Go for, minimal, go for minimalism, go for common axes, try to keep things simple. Bar plots are simple, they're clean, and you can easily compare the various results. Mm -hmm. Now, next box, the next univariate plots the box plot. Uh, there's an interesting, I'm just going to make a, an odd, uh, uh, so let me start with an apology there. Ignore the first bullet. I will go down in infamy for that bullet. Anyway, so these are an invention of Tukey's, and this is part of Tukey's general push for the five number summary and robust statistics in general. Box plot's just a visualization of the five number summary. Five number summary, if you're not familiar with, is just minimum, first quartile, median, third quartile, and maximum value. Okay. Anyway. Uh, so um, when we get to these with R, again, you know, there's a standard function, box plot. The important thing to note about the uh, to, to note about generating box plots in general, uh, the important thing about box plots and their generation is that there's usually a rule of thumb for handling the, handling the outliers. And of course, outliers are, as I've sort of been emphasizing here, a major headache whenever you're doing security visualization. So, in the case of R, it's controlled with um, a uh, it's controlled with the parameter range. And if my memory serves correctly, the default for the range is about 1.5 times the interquartile distance. If you take a look at that image, you'll see that there's a dot at the top and a dot at the bottom, which is, in this case, those two outliers. If I'd set range to the appropriate value, the whiskers would have moved out all the way. These are rules of thumb. The thing is, outliers are interesting. They're usually the thing that you're actually going to spend the most time taking a look at and figuring out why they're there in the first place. So you should understand what's causing them. 
So, you know, I would actually even push down the range value um, simply so that I have more outliers to examine and more understanding of what to get rid of. Okay? Now, when actually taking a look or understanding what a box plot is, let's just uh, compare a box plot to a histogram itself. Okay? So you can see the histogram, you can see the box plot, and you can see the comparison between the values. Now, when I'm actually looking at box plot, you know, the first questions I usually ask myself, is it asymmetrical? Why is it asymmetrical? What's the length of the whiskers relative to the, uh, uh, relative to the length of the total box itself? Sort of, am I seeing tightly clustered data or am I seeing outliers that are really pushing out? If I see a box plot with huge whiskers, then I get concerned, okay? I might also, for example, uh, I might uh, throw in a secondary line showing the mean of the plot, things like that, okay? And now let's get to the Swiss Army knife plot. All right. Of course, the, the plot that, uh, quite frankly, you go nuts with, uh, scatter plots, bivariate plots, your classic dot plot. Um, so <coughs> go, you'll, you know, the bread and butter plot that you will go mad from seeing all the time. Okay? The nice thing, of course, in R, you call plot. And there you go. Um, now, uh, Interestingly enough, I'm going to uh, again apologize for this slide because the dots on this plot are not outliers. That was uh, in the box plot. Mea culpa. Uh, I hope that this indication of a uh, mortality and a mistake will not cause everybody to sign off immediately. <laughs> anyway, okay, so let's actually take a look at what a, a, a scatter plot actually is like. The things that I'm curious about when I look at a, scot box pl a scatter plot. I'm interested in density, I'm interested in linear relationships. Again, in exploratory data analysis, what I'm really looking for is I'm looking for whether or not uh, there's anything that merits further investigation. So I'm going to be taking a look to see if I see linear relationships. I'm going to be looking to see if there's a cluster of information in one area. Um, honestly, given the choice between scatter plots and regression, I generally prefer using scatter plots to find linear relationships. Um, and it's in many cases simply the fact that uh, the, data, the data we're dealing with is sufficiently messy that I'm not sure that I get that much out of the regression analysis as opposed to having all the data in pre uh, present and accounted for. Now, if we're dealing with bivariate visualizations where we've got, uh, or, uh, where we've got categorical data, the next step usually is to start doing things like stacked box plots, which are exactly what they sound like, multiple box plots on the same chart. And they're useful for comparing distributions, ranges of multiple variables. For example, I've got um, some studies I've been doing on um, uh, traffic from dark spaces, and uh, I've, got, uh, I've got the categorical breakdowns of different slash 16s that I'm getting the traffic from and the distribution of the same sample size over time. I'm using the box plots for those, and then I plot the full day as a long sequence of box plots. Okay? To do it, you just add additional sets to the initial R box plot call. But this is really the point where we get away from, um, from sort of canned variables and we get into multivariate visualization, which is really the point where um, we're getting away from we're getting away from sort of initially available common visualizations to more opportunities to roll your own. And unfortunately, part of the problem is that most of the default tool sets give you the ability to create really hideous visualizations on your own without much work. Case in point, this visualization here. So, you know, and the reason for that is because there's a couple of easy ways to add ugly uh, to add ugly data to these plots and really ugly in this case is not so much aesthetic for me as hard to interpret and that's uh, you know this goes back to my commentary on pie charts earlier pie charts are a good example of a write only graph it's easy to write them hard to read them with multivariate data it's very easy to add information that's hard to read, but easy to write. Uh, in particular, because as people, we are pattern matching machines. And once you start making decisions on items like color or glyph choice, you have to be consistent with them or people go nuts. Now, 
Uh, and just as an example, let's consider color. You would think that adding additional colors is easy, but in my experience, you can get away with about four colors. The first reason being that um, you, know, you can usually do red, blue, black, and then some composite like aquamarine or maybe purple. You can't use green because red-green colorblindness is an issue, and you can't use yellow because yellow never shows up on a white background. Uh, and you know you end up having to choose a background color, which is then of course going to cost you what it, it's going to cost you that color for your display. Okay, same thing happens with the glyphs. I cannot tell the difference between you know I can probably tell the difference between a circle, a triangle, and a square, but after that, pentagons, crosses, all of the other options available, it, they get complicated and messy way too easily. In my case. I generally avoid using color in favor of trellising. And this is what I mean by that. This is a trellis plot. In, uh, in ours case, they call this a pairs plot. So given a data frame, you call pairs on it. And what it does is it provides you with stacked scatter plots showing every pair of data sets in the frame. And this, to me, is how you should really do multivariate visualization. And I think in particular, when you're looking at pushing this information out to consoles, when you're thinking in terms of showing something to an operator, I think that this is generally a better way to do it. And uh, the reason that I think that this is a better way to do it is because the information is clean, the relationships are cleanly derivable, and it's always being presented consistently. And going back to my point about it's easier for me to find the relation, linear relationship, if you take a look at the volume and articles uh, plots there, you can see a nice linear relationship visible. Okay? Now, the thing about trellising um, is that uh, the real advantage of it Plotting is computationally cheap for us to do. Uh, so instead of building one complicated plot, it's actually generally easier to build a dozen cheap plots. Okay? So, now doing trellising. Okay. The key thing with trellising is that it works best when you have low density, simple plots. These include things like boxes, which are a fairly compact representation, spark lines. If you've got some kind of simple mutation, a simply mutated shape, you can possibly get away with that. In Menard's classic uh, plot of France, he used pie charts. Insert terrifying chord there. Um, there are examples in multivariate visualization of things called Chernoff faces, but I've never, uh, to be honest, I've never seen a Chernoff face actually used except as an example of you can use Chernoff faces for multivariate visualization. Um, if anyone's actually ever used a Chernoff face, I'd really be interested to hear about it. Anyway, but um, simple things like box plots, as I said, spark lines. So the example I've got here with this one simple trellis, that's using uh, spark lines. And I've actually got a model even within the spark lines. I've got uh, a um, mean uh, and standard deviation actually represented by shading. And since these are actually uh, three dependent variables off of the same independent variable, if there's a correlated value, it shows up uh, at the same point on each of these plots. Okay? Uh, and also pushing common information to the axes. Um, if you go back and you take a look at the uh, trellis plot that I showed earlier, um, you know, this idea of this uh, diagonal axis, which actually shows what the, various, uh, vari what the various independent variables are, and then the common uh, numeric values plotted on the side. I really like that. Okay? Now, and this gets to the point about EDA, completing the EDA cycle and, and publishing the information. Ultimately, EDA is talking to yourself. Um, and so when you're talking to yourself, I hope you're honest. Um, that means that really what you should be doing is you should be taking a look at outliers, you should be taking a look at garbage, and you should think about what you're doing as a rough draft. I find that one of the best tools for EDA is acknowledging that what you're doing is exploratory and that at some point you're going to step back and say, this is really the um, uh, best approach to use. Anyway, um, when you get to an actual final product, then uh, 
Once you've gotten there, then you can consider uh, story, narrative, and output. The example I've got down here with the um, uh, really messy equation that's primarily for intimidation value uh, is actually, when it's in operational use, it's actually a very simple plot. It's just indicating whether or not uh, two particular variables are uh, able to detect something. And it's actually a simple story to tell an analyst, which is, if a variable is in the box in the center, then you know uh, you've got a problem. Okay. Anyway, so but that sort of gets us to the end of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so <coughs> what I've done today is really I've sort of talked about visualization and its role in EDA. Um, one of the things I've tried to hit on in particular is this idea that EDA is, uh, you know, a rough sort of mix of an art and science. There's a lot of computational techniques that are available for use, but the real art is learning to interpret the data and identify weird stuff. Um, the next step is developing an intuition for that, which is really where you go out and you find data, you poke at the data, and you start to understand why it is weird or why it is not weird. Um, one of the things that I have found um, that I do an awful lot these days is I've set up labs where I have um, NetFlow collectors and packet data. And I tend to use NetFlow a lot uh, in operational environments because it gives me a lot of coverage for cheap. And what I'll do is I'll do exploration with the flow of the packet data until I, uh, where I'm looking at the same phenomenon until I've got a good relationship between the two that I can then push out to an actual analytic. So anyway. Okay, so I think that covers the. Co I think that covers everything I was going to discuss uh, during this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, I think we move on to Q and A now. Excellent presentation, Michael. Thank you so much. Um, we do have several questions that have come in, and folks, if you do have a question for Michael and what he's been talking to you about, please open your group chat widget, type it in, send it in, and we'll take as many as we have time for. Okay. Are you able to see them, or would you like me to read them to you? Um, um, I can see them, so I'll start with um, number, I'll, I'll start uh, answering them. So, okay, let me start actually with the, uh, the, the question about data sets, because I know that this is one that uh, everyone really does have trouble with. Okay, so in terms of data sets to poke at, um, there's a couple, there's a large number of different data sets that are available now for training purposes. Um, I'll and um, the first data set that I would recommend looking at is if you take a look for the cyber defense exercise, I, I'm going to just sort of rattle off Google terms here, but if you look for the cyber defense exercise or CDX uh, data set from West Point, uh, the cyber defense exercise is a war game uh, that is conducted at the military academies every year. West Point has, at le has recorded at least one large data set of uh, attacks and uh, the team defending against them that's available for um, that's available for consumption if you're operating in an academic or otherwise uh, fun if you're operating in an academic or federally funded environment then what you should do is you should take a look at the Predict repository, which was founded by the DHS. Uh, that is, uh, they have a large number of different data sets uh, that are available for analysis and experimentation. Um, the, those are sort of the two biggest ones that I'd start with. Um, there's the Lincoln Labs repository, uh, although the Lincoln Labs repository, the Lariat data set was created around 99 and probably isn't as directly, um, yeah, in fact, I wouldn't say that it, I wouldn't say it's not as directly relevant. It's, you shouldn't use it if you want to do publishable research, I think, in these days. Um, but those would be my sort of jumping off points. Uh, I, there are a couple of other ones, and um, uh, I'll do a follow-up uh, supplement to tell where to look for these. Okay. Now, uh, We've got a question here about NetFlow data preparation and transformation, and um, also one that I think uh, where I think there's also a sort of related question about um, variables that I have that have the greatest significance in modeling data. 
What I find oftentimes with the data sets is that I find that I have to do a lot of partitioning and pulling the data apart. Uh, I, have to, I have to do an awful lot of stratification as a first order item. And several of the categories that I stratify on, um, is this a client session or is this a server session? So for example, at least initially I'll crudely partition by is the port number above 1024 or is the port number below 1024? Um, is this a payload bearing TCP session? Do I see an ACK flag? Do I see indication that it's actual traffic? And the reason for that is because when you're working with any data set and you're looking at a security problem, the place where you're really getting hurt is you're getting hurt by um, all the scan data and also all the legitimate failed connections. If you take a look at SMTP traffic on the wire, it is a sewer. Uh, so legitimate session versus illegitimate session, partitioning out, um, partitioning out uh, so that I've got client port versus um, non-client port. Those are sort of the first stabs. Um, after that, there are a couple of other high-level constructs. I like to take a look at byte per packet ratio. And the major reason I like to look at byte per packet ratio um, is because I like to see whether or not the session is behaving like a client or a server. At sort of the crude high-level NetFlow communications level, packet, you know, clients tend to have a packet payload size of about no, no bytes, and servers tend to have a packet payload size of about 1,500 bytes. And then anything outside of that range, for example, if you're dealing with chat protocols where you tend to see things that are below the MTU, those are sort of elements of interest for me. So anyway, let me just hit refresh and see what else I thought. Okay. So, okay. All right. All right. Um, so let's see. Wow, lots of people are asking questions now. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, I'd ask uh, Ms. Uh, Salem O'Connell if you could specify what you mean by NetFlow data types. Do you mean like V5 versus V9? Do you mean the additional fields in IP fix? Things like that. Um, in the meantime, I can answer another question. Um, so for tools of visual EDA outside of R, um, I've been playing at the moment with pandas and the like. Um, you know, honestly, uh, I sort of picked R as you know it's sort of a default standard tool that a um, large number of people are familiar with. Uh, I would say that um, you know from my perspective, uh, I yeah I honestly can't say at this point uh, how I would feel about Shiny and Tableau versus R, except to say that I'm usually pushing for other things. The, major advantage of R at this point is that it's also a statistical pearl in the sense that everyone's written libraries for it. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, quick question. Okay. Um, so, okay. All right. Oh, yes. Yeah, so a question about other case studies in the book. Uh, I've got uh, I've got sort of walkthroughs of various phenomena in the book. Um, I'm also planning to put up an educational supplement that'll have a case study in more depth. All right. Okay. All right. Um, so, okay. Somebody was asking what the advantages of histograms over KDA uh, over kernel uh, kernel density uh, based uh, density plots are. And the short answer, honestly, is simplicity. I might have spent a little too much time teaching E ones how to do statistical analysis. Okay. All right, question. Depending on the size busyness of the net network, do you use Hadoop, MR, or just straight uh, R or Python on a workstation? Um, I'm a little bit uh, corrupted here because I spent a lot of time working with Silk. Um, and one of the things that I found is that, you know, in particular when I was sampling or collecting 
uh, data for analysis, I usually started out with, um, I usually tried to get down to the point where I had maybe a couple gigabyte sized data set or, or something that was otherwise R digestible as a starting off point. Um, from my perspective, when I have done stuff in Hadoop, honestly, I've rarely used Hadoop itself for exploratory analysis. I've usually pushed out much, uh, much more well-defined queries or analytics to Hadoop at that point. Ah, okay, NetFlow V9. Okay, so um, as regards NetFlow V9, um, in a lot of cases, uh, I'll wave my hand at the moment for the extensions that were done for IP fix uh, over at the CERT, at least partly because those are the ones that I had the, uh, those are the ones that I had a um, awful lot of time uh, helping to inform. Uh, so things, for example, like figuring out which uh, which side of the session, uh, which which address actually initiated the session, also the initial TCP flags. Uh, TCP flag reconstructions are uh, one of the biggest headaches that I've uh, had to deal with. Okay. All right. Okay. Hmm. 